Bonica. Look straight ahead, my face towards the sun. We will get through and we'll overcome all change. It's gonna come. Oh, change. It's gonna come. Oh, change. It's gonna come. Hey, I'm Hans Hess. Thank you for joining me today. We're going to have a great time in the Word of God today. I want you to open your heart, open your mind to the Word, and let the Spirit of the Lord speak to you today. You know, I've been so blessed to come to you by television for the past few years and really reach the four corners of the globe through TV and through Internet, through Zoom crusades we've been doing. It's just, it's just amazing what God is doing in the earth realm right now. I heard this said recently that we're hearing the beginning raindrops of the third great awakening. I really believe that in my heart. I've, I've participated in revival for decades, but what I see happening in the young adults in the United States and on the mission field, it's absolutely amazing and exciting. So I want you to open your heart, open your mind. Let's listen to the word of God. I'm coming preaching and believing that God is good. He is ultimately good and he has good in store for you, and he has good intentions for you. So open up your heart, listen to the word today. If you have your Bibles with you, uh, please turn in them to Luke chapter 24. And we're talking about being a witness. And last week we began this by talking about Mary Magdalene, who was the first witness of the resurrection according to the Bible. And we dealt with how her life um, really is a model for us to look at as to how we should be witnesses. You know, she came to the tomb. Uh, she was a changed life. And then once she encountered the risen Jesus, she ran and told the disciples. And I talked about how being a witness involves us. You know, you got to go tell somebody a life that's been changed. You're not defined by your past anymore. That's a true witness. Amen? Amen. And today I'm going to look at another passage here of two witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus. And we're marching toward the Great Commission in the end when he appears to his disciples, if you haven't noticed. We're with Mary Magdalene first today with the two men or two people on the road to Emmaus, and then next week I'm going to deal with when he actually appears to his disciples before his ascension. So we're, we're all post-resurrection passages here marching our way to Resurrection Sunday. So look at, look at the Bible with me uh, in Luke chapter 24, and I'm just going to read a few verses of this and then circle back around and get the whole story. Verse 28 says, Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them, and now as it came to pass, as he sat at table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them, then their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And he vanished from their sight, and they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Can we say amen? What's happening in this passage is that there are two people walking on, a, on the road to a town called Emmaus, verse 13. And verse 15, while they were talking with each other and reasoning that Jesus himself drew near and started walking along with them. But what's interesting is they didn't recognize him. Verse 16 says, but their eyes were restrained. So I, I don't know, I, I, it's a beautiful story, what's going on here. And I think, you know, evidently, supernaturally, their eyes were not open to who he was. They didn't recognize him. But there's a meaning, there's a spiritual meaning going on here that I want us to mine out. So just give me a few minutes to mine this thing out this morning because it's so rich. There's something happening on a deeper level here. And so then they begin to uh, talk, and Jesus says to them in verse 17, what kind of conversation is this that you've, you have with one another as you walk and are sad? 
and the one whose name was Cleopas, and that's the only name we're given, Cleopas, and we don't know who they were. Many believe they were two men who were not of the 11 remaining disciples, but were in the larger circle of, of followers of Jesus. Some believe that this was Cleopas, who was the husband of Mary, Mary who was at the cross with Mary, the mother of Jesus. It's a, it's a theory. And that uh, the two walking here were actually Cleopas and his wife Mary. If that was the case, just think about it. Uh, it, it according to tradition, uh, Cleopas was Joseph's brother. And if that's the case, then, you know, he would have known Jesus from birth and as a child. And Mary would have been a sister-in-law who stayed with Mary, the mother of Jesus, all the way to the cross. So it makes a lot of sense. But we're not told who, who they were except Cleopas. Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, they say? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? I mean, Jesus is just playing along with their conversation here. So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping... But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things, things have happened. Something's going on here that I think we need to mine out. And that is, there was this whole atmosphere happening in first century Israel that they... The, the, the people believed in the coming of the Messiah because the Messiah had been prophesied all through Old Testament Scripture. And so they believed in the coming of the Messiah, and the Messiah to them was one who would come and take back physically the kingdom of Israel, restore the golden age of the, the Davidic monarchy, have a king on the throne, being out of the line of David, this Messiah and that the Romans would be defeated, they would be kicked out of Israel, and once again, God would have his people and his nation in their physical land. That's what they were looking for. You know, um, it's, it's evident, even in some of the early, uh, what we call Second Temple period literature, that this was the expectation. If you look into the Qumran community and the Dead Sea Scrolls, or look into other Second Temple period literature, they were looking for a Messiah to come as a military conqueror and push out Roman, Romans, reestablish Israel. When you encounter the group called the Zealots in the Gospels, those are the guys. Those are the guys. They're looking to take up arms at any moment and kick the Romans out. They're just looking for a leader. And so when Jesus, in John chapter 6, feeds the 5,000 miraculously, the Bible says they were desiring to make him king because they had this messianic expectation. And so what did Jesus do? He dispersed the crowd, put his disciples in a boat and set them on the Sea of Galilee, and he went to a mountain alone to be with the Father. If we look into the book of Matthew, chapter 16, Jesus goes with his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, which was a vacation spot for the Romans because it was up in the mountains and it was cool. And they're walking along and Jesus says, who do men say that I am? And they said, well, some say you're this and some say you're that. But, uh, but he says, but who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ or you are the Messiah. Christ is a Greek translation of the Old Testament term Messiah. You are the Messiah. In other words, all that he was bringing to that was all of his understanding. You are the one who's going to physically restore Israel. You're the one who's going to lead us to victory. And Jesus said, Simon, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which art in heaven. And he said, I say unto you, you're Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then he began to explain how he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer and die at the hands of the authorities 
And Peter stands up, the same Peter who had just had the revelation that he was a Messiah, and stands up and is like, don't let it be so, Lord. Because it's conflicting with what he thinks the Messiah should do. The Messiah isn't one who's going to go give his life and die. The Messiah is one who's going to take up a sword and clean it out. And he looks at him and he says what? Get behind me, Satan, because he heard that familiar temptation. He heard that familiar temptation to take the kingdoms of the earth. The same temptation that Satan passed before him when he was in the wilderness fasting. Take the authority now over all the kingdoms of the earth. He heard that familiar deal. So when he meets these two on the road to Emmaus, they haven't worked it out in their heads yet what really just happened. They've heard reports that he's been raised from the dead or that he's resurrected, but they're still trying to figure out and work through their understanding of what a Jewish Messiah is. And they use a term here, and it's the term redeem. It's a powerful term. Verse 21, we were hoping he was going to redeem us. Now, the first time the word redeem is ever used in the Bible is in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 6 and verse 6, before Pharaoh is confronted by Moses and Aaron, God is speaking to Moses, and he says this in chapter 6, verse 6 of Exodus. I am the Lord. I will bring you from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will redeem you. So to an Israelite, redemption meant deliverance for the whole people a crushing of their enemies, and a coming out of slavery into freedom. They were looking for another Moses. They were looking for another Moses. So let's go on with the story. This is good. Give me time to paint it and... Verse 21 of Luke 24. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things have happened. Yes, and certain of our women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. But remember, the men didn't believe it. I thought the women would shout amen there, but I don't know. When they did not find his body, they came saying that he who had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive and certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women said, but him they did not see. And then Jesus responds and says this, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And they're like, What? And it says, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Jesus took them back to Moses and started explaining all of the scriptures to them. Then they get to the house, and he's going to journey on, and they beg him to stay. And so in traditional Jewish fashion, they have a meal. And usually the head of the household would take charge and break the bread and say the prayers. But Jesus did it at this occasion. And he took the bread and he broke it. And when he did that, the Bible says the two men that didn't know who he was, their eyes were opened. And they realized, oh man, this is Jesus sitting with us. And then he disappeared. I think the word Emmaus is important here. Because Emmaus was a village where Judas Maccabees defeated the Syrian army in the intertestamental period. And when the Jews of the first century looked back to the Messiah coming, they thought he would be kind of a Judas Maccabees type person. It meant, his name meant the hammer. They were looking for 
the hammer. They were looking for someone to come like the Maccabees and drive out by miraculous power the Romans. But what happens to Jesus is so opposite to what they were thinking. He didn't come as a Moses. He came as the Passover lamb. He didn't come as a military conqueror. He let them conquer him. He let the evil guys kill him. Completely reverse from what human nature would think was right. Completely opposite to what you and I would want to read in a great story. The hero doesn't die like that. The Messiah wasn't supposed to die. But then he starts explaining to them the scripture and revelation comes. This is deep and it's really rocked my world to look at it like this. I've never preached on this passage to, to my remembrance. And it's really rocked my world to think of it. But we're, let, me, let me just lay out some things. Revelation happens to these two men or two people on the road to Emmaus. Their eyes are open. And to me, revelation comes by word and spirit. So what's happening here is Jesus sits down and begins taking them through the Bible and showing really how the Messiah must suffer and die. Let me show you a few scriptures. Isaiah 52, verse 13. Isaiah said, centuries before Jesus came, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them, they shall see, and what they had not heard, they shall consider. Isaiah 53, verse 12. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul unto death. The Messiah poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Psalm chapter 2 is another, uh, Psalm 2 is another messianic psalm and I want to look at it just for a moment here. It's, it's another indication of what was going to happen to the Messiah. Psalm 2, why do the nations rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. But it's to him who will be given the nations as his inheritance. Can somebody shout amen? amen? Because the Bible did say a great prophet would come. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 18, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet, Moses said, like me from among your fellow Israelites, and you must listen to that prophet. But as they went along for centuries, that person never appeared. Even when John the Baptist appeared, they asked him, are you Elijah? Are you a prophet? Are you not just a prophet? Are you the prophet? Are you the one we've been looking for since Moses' time? And Jesus is the one who came and fulfilled that role as prophet. Not only that, he came and fulfilled the role as healer. Not only that, he came and fulfilled the role as the suffering servant of God from the suffering servant psalms of Isaiah. He was the one who came not to conquer Rome by physical force, not to take Jerusalem back by physical force, not to set up his kingdom and execute judgment on all the enemies. He did just the opposite, it seems, in the eyes of the world. He gave his life as a ransom on the cross, and he gave it away. He came to give his life a ransom for many. For the Son of God came and gave his life and was crucified so that we could receive life. Amen. The Son of God came and was crucified 
because it had to fulfill the Old Testament understanding and demand of a sacrificial offering, that there would be an offering one day according to the tabernacle system that would supersede it and transcend it, that no longer would a priest have to go in once a year and sacrifice a spotless lamb that would last for one year, but that was looking prophetically to the future where there would come a lamb, the ultimate lamb, who would give his life a ransom for many. And it's interesting that in the road to Emmaus, the place of battle, he's revealing the true understanding of who he really was. He wasn't a military conqueror. He was a lamb that would sacrifice his life for the world. He was the same one that taught us when someone strikes you on one cheek, turn the other. When someone asks you for a coat, give them your cloak also. When someone speaks evil of you, forgive them. He, he taught a complete upside-down kingdom. A complete upside-down kingdom. And he knew it was the plan of God that this method of coming as an upside-down leader and an, in an upside-down kingdom would be the very thing that would change planet Earth. And it would be the hope of all nations. Because the nations didn't need another military leader. The nations needed the Son of God to come and give his life as a ransom for many. You and I didn't need another politician. We needed a Savior. You and I didn't need another talker. We needed a lamb slain from the foundation of the earth that would take away my sin. Politics can't cure the sin problem in your life. Only the Lord from heaven can cure the sin problem in your life. Hallelujah, a certain theory or philosophy can't break the power of oppression or addiction off your life. It takes a lamb slain from the foundation of the earth to take away the sin and break the oppression. Hallelujah, he came so that you and I could be set free. He came and laid down his life. He could have called 10,000 angels with one word, but he refrained from that power and authority because he knew there was a Hans one day who would need to be born again, who was lost as a bat hallelujah and he needed a savior and I needed the precious blood he knew you would come along one day and politics lasts for a season and leaders last for a season but the precious blood of Jesus lasts for out all eternity because after he was resurrected he ascended to the throne of God and the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that he took his blood the blood of the only lamb of God and he sprinkled it upon the mercy seat that once and for all, we would have access now to the very throne and to the glory and to salvation and true redemption. Can somebody give him a shout of praise? Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. He came as a lamb on the festival of Passover, and they didn't understand it. He came as a suffering servant during the Passover feast, and they didn't see it. But when he sat down at the table with them and took the bread and broke it, they understood. They understood. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a spiritual angle interpretation of this, okay? So hang on. I believe it's in the context of worship, in context of fellowship, that we receive revelation. We receive revelation through the Word, but there's something special that happens when we come and break bread with one another. That's why I've asked us to do communion today together. There's something deep and something spiritual that happens. Because, you know, uh, we, we have two ordinances of the church we really follow, water baptism and Lord's Supper. And through the years and through the centuries, those two ordinances have, have lost their meaning and been devalued of meaning. And it was a reaction against the Catholic Church. Because the Catholic Church believes in a sacramentalism that when you are baptized, you are saved. And when, you, when the priest consecrates the bread, the host it transforms into the body of Jesus physically. It's called, you know, there's a transubstantiation that happens. That comes out of medieval philosophy. And, and because of that, the reformers really rejected that. 
And then as we got down the road, it became just, we're just going to do this in memory of Jesus. We're going to remember that night. Or we're going to be baptized just as a symbol. Now, they are symbols, but I'm telling you, there is still something spiritual that happens in it. Why would Paul warn the church about taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner? There was a warning on it. Why? Because it's not just a memory thing. There's something spiritual happening in it. You know, the Reformers talked about God moving in and through the sacraments. And God moves in and through. When you're baptized, you're saved by repenting and accepting Jesus into your heart. But when you're baptized, God comes and touches you in the waters of baptism. There is a sanctifying thing that happens in the waters of baptism. That's why if you haven't been baptized, I would run and tell the Welcome Center I want to be baptized. I would run and tell them, obey the ordinance of Jesus. And if you're going to participate in the Lord's communion today, make sure your heart is His. Make sure you've given your life to Him. And something's going to happen in and through it as we partake of it. It's saying, Lord, I recognize who you are and who you were. You were the Messiah that came and gave your life for me. And I partake of every bit of that right now. And I'm going to believe you for this deep spiritual connection with you. I'm going to praise God. Thank you for listening today. And thank you for opening up your heart to hear the word of God. Listen, I want to pray for you quickly before we go off the air here. If you have any needs in your life or if you've never accepted Christ into your heart, I really want to see you make it to heaven. I want to see you finish this race well. Amen. God has provided the greatest gift of all history. That is, He gave us His Son that, who would die for us so that we wouldn't have to face eternity without God. So if you've never accepted Christ into your heart, let's start there today. Then I'm going to pray for healing and other needs in your life. So just pray this with me. Father, I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. Forgive me of all sin and become the Lord of my life, Lord Jesus. In your name, I pray. Now I'm going to pray for your needs. Father, in the name of Jesus, for those who are struggling in their bodies, struggling in their minds, Lord, I pray that you minister to them right now. I pray that you touch them by the power of your Holy Spirit. We bind every demonic influence in their life that's attacking them, and we cast it out, and we just declare the glory of God and victory of God in their hearts right now. In the name of Jesus, be set free by the power of God. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you for watching us. Go in victory and give God the praise. Look straight ahead, my face towards the sun. We will get.